When my dad was a young boy, he remembers a, a Sunday school teacher that had a very powerful visual aid that he mentioned to us, his children, a number of times. One day he just brought in a bunch of matchsticks and metal paper clips all mixed together and dumped them on, a, on the table in front of the, the class. He then he picked up a powerful magnet and he passed it over the, the mess and all the paper clips were drawn up to the magnet and the matchsticks didn't move. And then the last thing is he lit all the matchsticks on fire and it made quite an impression. Uh, and of course, then he told the students, he said, this is what will happen one day when Jesus comes back. All those who know Jesus will be caught up with him in the clouds, but the rest will stay on earth while it goes through the tribulation and the final judgment. Wow, pretty heavy, huh? But true. And I think it's a good illustration because it pictures final judgment, which Jesus didn't hesitate to teach. We're not going to get to that because we're just doing the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. But in the end of this sermon, Jesus will talk about a narrow road that leads to life. And very few there are, he, say, he says, who find it. And he talks about a broad road that leads to destruction. He said many are on that road. And in his teaching in the Gospels, he mentioned hell 27 times. Because he, of all people, knows it's real and out of love will speak the truth with people. He himself is the judge that we will all uh, be held accountable uh, to and come before and appear before. And so he's going to speak very clearly about judgment. It's real. But I like the illustration the Sunday school teacher used because not only is it describing the judgment, but it describes a difference that's already there but long before the judgment. See, we don't all know when we became a Christian, those of us who are Christian. It's a mystery. It's hard to know. But if you are one, it becomes very obvious that you're not like others who have not followed Jesus out of the kingdom of this world and into the kingdom of heaven. And so there's a big difference between paper clips and matchsticks. And there's a big difference between those who really know Jesus and are his followers and those who are not. And so these qualities that we're talking about at the beginning of the sermon, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, were not just an interesting way to describe morality. They're from the mouth of the one who is the judge himself. And he's describing at the beginning of his sermon those who will be blessed, not cursed, those who will be saved from the judgment that he strongly preaches at the end of his sermon. And that's why they're so important. Now, I don't want to just make them important because of judgment. They're important because we want to be Christian. We want that to go deep down in our DNA. And as a church here, are we truly Fairfield, Fairfield Christian church? Then we, then we must have these qualities. We must be familiar with them. They must mark our life. Jesus has, as the last week, the lion claws deep into our soul and places these qualities there. And, and the reason I'm bringing that up for today is the third one that we're talking about. Never is there a quality more different from our culture than the one today. And, and I love our culture. and It's not all bad. It's just that you'll see this quality is very unique, especially for us men. And, uh, and so uh, this is a good chance to ask yourself, am I different from my culture or am I in fact in the kingdom of this world? Have I really followed Jesus and been delivered into the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of light? And just check out the qualities. So the first one is blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are humble, those who no matter what they have, know it's nothing compared to what they could have in the kingdom of heaven. Those who know they're desperate before God and must beg and must plead for God to help, to bring forgiveness and salvation and a future in heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit who not only sense that condition, but then the second one, blessed are those who mourn, who feel it. They don't just see it and go, yeah, well, we're all degenerates, aren't we? They have this strong sense and, and God gives them this too, not just an awareness, but, but his feeling about it. And they cry, they stop their life, they mourn, it goes deep, and they, and, and, and they just can't continue because they see what it's really like and they cry about it. Now, if they're truly poor in spirit and they're mourning, now that the disciple of Jesus begins to enter into the world, we see them relate in a way that is meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, we're going to look at the quality itself and see what it means. 
And we'll see some examples. We'll do that first. The quality itself, if, if it's so distinguishable, if it's so unique and a great way to see if you're really a Christian, then let's look at it. What does meekness mean? Well, it follows from the first two, as we said, if you're poor in your spirit, it's one thing to admit that yourself. It's another thing to enter your world and somebody else begins to tell you that. Somebody else begins to pick up on some of those conditions that God's already showing you that you're already mourning and somebody else says, you know what, and they, and, they, and they criticize you or they speak negatively or they accuse you of some part of that. How do you react? It's one thing to say you're poor in spirit, but when somebody else says you're poor in spirit, do you, do you defend, do you, are you indignant? Well, that will test the third quality. Because if you're truly poor in spirit and mourning about it, then when you begin to relate, people in the world will see that. It'll be obvious what you think of yourself, the way you relate to others. Now, meekness, let's get it straight. Meekness is not weakness. They rhyme, but they don't mean the same thing. Meekness is not weakness. It's strength under control, like a horse taking the bit. All right, a horse can be powerful, and, it, and if, it, if it's broken by its master and it takes the bit, then that's the picture of meekness. And so when we see some of these examples, you'll see what I mean. Meekness is not weakness. It's strength under control. It's being tamed to God, tamed to Jesus, tamed toward ourselves. And it results in a gentleness and a softness toward others. A gentleness. And so it's often... Uh, includes the idea of gentleness. Blessed are the gentle. Because they're broken, they're, they're meek toward themselves, they're tame towards God and His will, and so when they enter life, they're, they have a soft touch. We don't demand for ourselves because we know we're not worthy of these demands. And uh, when people speak evil of us, we say, well, you don't know the half of it. Let me tell you, there's a lot more I see about myself than what you happen to discover. Or you may not even be right on this one point, but there's like 10 other things let me share with you from my poverty of spirit that you should, that, you know, see the difference? A meek person doesn't react because the wild horse in them has been broken. Whatever would not be meek that would go about stomping and grabbing and getting there first and shoving others out of the way, that was broken in the first two Beatitudes by Jesus. Already to this point, since they began to follow Jesus, he's already broken that. And now it's just simply saying, as you begin to relate in the world, we see that, that tameness. You have a genuine poverty of spirit, you're mourning it. You feel that before God deeply. Therefore, you don't think God and the whole world owes you anything. You don't demand your rights. You don't have rights. You don't come into the kingdom of God and say, this is mine. You, you don't deserve to be there at all, and you know it. So there's a completely different spirit. And in our culture, obviously, we believe in freedom and fighting for our freedom. We believe in defending our rights. We believe in competing and winning. But all of those things only go so far. They do not bring us the earth and all that is good in it. All the good things in life, family and health and safety and our future. All the things, true happiness and hope, you don't get them by defending and fighting and winning and competing. Um, that's a very limited experience, what that can bring. So the meek know that, and the meek are different. And we see this comes out. It's a strong Christian virtue. Well, maybe it'll help then to see some examples. If that's a little bit of what it means, let's look at some examples. You see, meekness is not low-volume, mild living. It's another misconception. It's not a just a feminine quality. That's another misconception. It exists in the life of strong men in the Bible. Strong men. I'll show you five examples of what I mean. It's not just a, a natural niceness that some people have in their personalities. No, in the Bible you see it where it shouldn't be. You see it in a, a man's life who otherwise has got strength and authority. And it's a supernatural meekness, not just a temperament that you might see or, or, or like some puppies in a litter are like this. It's different. It's, it's from God. It's from the Holy Spirit. It's not just a general meekness. It's a focused meekness on self and on God. And it coexists with great authority and great strength. Let me show you what I mean. The first example would be Abraham, a very powerful and wealthy man. He was experiencing conflict with his nephew, Lot. They were both very blessed, very wealthy, and their servants were fighting, so it was time to separate camps. 
And so Abraham called Lot over, who was much younger, and he said to Lot, there is land before us, you choose first. Lot chose the best land. Abraham didn't. He let him do that. That was meek. A person who's not meek grabs something first, thinks that they're going to get more if they grab first or make the first choice. Abraham says, no. You chose for, Lot chose the best land. It put him close to Sodom and Gomorrah. That led him and his family into great trouble and the great problems. Abraham, on the other hand, we know, was promised the land given to his descendants, the promised land. So he ends up getting, and we know all this from the retrospect, from being able to look back in the scripture, that he got so much more. And then when Lot got in trouble being close to Sodom, four kings came because of his association with those evil cities. Four kings took him and his family captive. And in Genesis 14, when Abraham heard this, he took 318 of his trained men and he rescued Lot and his family and all his stuff. Abraham was not weak. He was meek. And there's a big difference. He had a supernatural meekness that was focused on himself, but that was still compatible with great strength. And he exerted that strength in his life and was greatly blessed by God. Let's take Moses. Here's another example, the prince of Egypt. Again, very man, a manly man, but he was meek. One of the meekest men in all the world, according to the scripture. He had all the riches of Egypt as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But instead, when he found out he was a Hebrew, he chose to associate himself with the reproach of the Hebrew slaves. And so he joined the millions of Israelites who were in slavery. He was meek to his own desires, didn't continue on with the riches of Egypt. And yet we saw him when he was leading the people of Israel later. He came down from the Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and he saw them worshiping the golden calf. And he threw the Ten Commandments down, powerfully expressing the wrath of God. His meekness was focused on himself and not just a general meekness. You see, you can be meek and still be confident and still be aggressive at times and still be passionate for God and even express righteous anger. And at the same time, you can be meek. He was meek toward himself. He chose to associate himself with his, his own countrymen and give up the treasures of Egypt. David had killed his tens of thousands in battle as a mighty warrior. But when it came to one man who stood between him and the kingdom, he would not take Saul's life. David was running as a fugitive in the wilderness, hiding because Saul had the kingdom and Saul was chasing and trying to kill him for no good reason. And he discovered Saul in a cave and his mighty men were all around him and he had a chance to kill Saul, but he would not lift his hand against the Lord's anointed. He would not take for himself what only God could give him in God's good time. And so here's this powerful warrior, and and all he has to do is just take one more life, but he won't do it because he's meek. He was meek. He would not stretch out his hand. He would not try to bring into his life what only God could bring. And so he waited, even though it meant continuing to be a fugitive, running for his life in the wilderness. And we should not miss the connection between this meekness and David being the greatest king in all of Israel. Track, Track it back, that he knew that there's just some things only God can give you and you can't take them for yourselves. And those are the best things in life. And so even though he was a mighty man, he understood that he was meek. He would not reach out his hand and take that for himself. Then there was Stephen, we now come in the New Testament and two final examples, Stephen, the first Christian martyr. After he preached a glorious spirit-filled sermon, it says in Acts 7, verse 54, when the crowd heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Obviously a euphemism for death. He died just like Jesus did because he was really a disciple of Jesus because he was really like Jesus. And you could see that he was a paperclip, not a matchstick. And one of the ways was when people were actually stoning him for, for, again, nothing that he had done. He wasn't defensive. He wasn't fighting back. 
He was filled with the Spirit, and he saw the realities of heaven in Jesus. And when he did, this is what came out of him. Meekness. Meekness. Father, forgive them. I know they don't fully understand what they're doing. They don't even know it. So pardon them. This is a Jesus thing, a mark that comes for those who are really following Jesus. We should look for it in our own lives. It's a confirmation. It's meekness. Meekness. This is what comes out of us. And yet it wasn't weakness. The blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. This kind of story was repeated over and over as the church exploded all around the world, just like Stephen, so many more martyrs. And it was through their death, it was through losing and dying that the church took off all around the world. Not through defending and, and winning and, and protecting, killing others. It was through being willing to give up, just like Jesus gave up his life. Meekness. It's very different, very different from the American culture especially. And now let's go to Jesus himself. Was he meek? Yes, Jesus himself was the ultimate example of meekness. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. A donkey? That's not like 300, right? Not like the 300 movie, right? On a colt, it says, the foal, the foal of a donkey. Not a white horse, a donkey, not a beast of war, a beast of burden. Sitting side saddle. What a wimp, right? And yet in his gentle, meek way, he stormed the gates of hell. Speaking of his gentleness, in Isaiah 42, verse 3, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And yet he cast out thousands of demons, sending them screaming to the abyss. Do you see the power of meekness? Because this power can be in your life, but it's different than the American hero. It's different than the protagonist that we see in the movies, in the books, in the culture, in the kingdom of this world. So different. Isaiah 53, 7 describes Jesus' amazing victory over sin in the grave this way. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Oh. He was led like a lamb, like a lamb, the lamb of God. Do you see the meekness? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And in this gentle and meek way, he paid the penalty for our sins. He broke its power. He offered eternal life to all who would believe in him. And he is leading. And if you're following, you too will develop this unique quality of meekness. And it will have many opportunities every day to come out. Many opportunities. Do you stick up for yourself? Do you fight for yourself? Do you defend everything around you? Do you react to everything as if it was your right that you deserve, that you did this and you have to protect this? Jesus Christ shows us the power of meekness, its strength under control, its tameness, its gentleness, its focused on ourself and on God, its supernatural when it even shouldn't be there. It's a quality that grows with great strength and great authority. And now with that, let's look at the promise. If that's somewhat of an attempt to describe the quality, <laughs> Then let's see what Jesus promised. Jesus, the one who cast out the demons. Jesus, the one who healed the sick. Jesus, the one who's our ultimate judge one day, who died on the cross to forgive our sins. This is the one who's giving these qualities. These aren't just poetry. This isn't just some author. These are the qualities given us by Jesus for those who are truly coming through and are his disciples and they're beautiful. And, and this is what he promised. He said, now these people that are like this, they, they alone, they shall inherit the earth. I know if I look up inherit in the dictionary, I, I look at it and it says antonym, which means opposite. The opposite of this word is to earn. There you go, grace for they shall inherit. I'm familiar with this word because I married into Lynn's family, the Tanky family, and Lynn's dad did very well in the insurance business. And so after 32 years of marriage, I look around and most of the stuff we own, I didn't earn. So I'm not proud of it, I'm just a little embarrassed. 
Okay, I have it all because I married the right woman. <laughs> all right? And there's a, that's a very humble thing. Very humble thing to say. No pride. <laughs> very little ownership. You know what I'm saying? It was brought. Somebody else earned it. But I got it. It's a whole different spirit for how you enjoy, how you maintain your whole perspective on it. For they shall inherit the earth. So that means in the Christian's life, everything in the earth, it's really good when you get it and you get it from Jesus because he promised it and he gives it to you. You don't say, well, this is mine. <clears throat> Man, did you get it in? <clears throat> Look at him, oh, I'm gonna beat you up to get this because I gotta conquer you and we have to win, then we get this. This is not that spirit at all. It's a whole different spirit. Jesus brought this. We just feel a little bit embarrassed, but we have it. And what's best in the world comes that way and it's all by grace. And no matter what you think about fighting for freedom or defending rights or competing and winning, those things are good, but they're just so limited. They will never get you to what's best in the earth. And that only comes by being meek and receiving and having it brought to you. They shall inherit the earth. I remember my son, Rick, when he was four years old, we did a birthday party for him and invited 12 of his little friends. Never do this, this is not a good idea, but we did and there was just like a nuclear reactor in our house. And so we got to the end of the party and the big finale was a candy hunt. And so we had gone to Sam's and got a big bag of candy and hid candy all in the backyard. And we, we told the little boys, we gave them a little bag and we said, now, whatever candy you find is yours. We opened the door, we said, go. What happened next? was the opposite of meekness. Okay, but very much like our culture, business, politics, sports. There's a great picture of that. You know, shoving, pushing, getting there first, I'll get more, I get ahead of you. Now let's imagine I had taken little Ricky, as we called him then, aside uh, before the party and said, hey, Ricky, I know you want your friends to have a good time. So, Here's the deal, when, when it's time for the candy hunt at the end, I want you to make sure that everybody's finding plenty of candy and don't worry about your own bag because when the party's over, I promise we'll go to a movie and we'll stop at the convenience store first and when we do, we'll get some real candy, not that Sam candy stuff, I don't know, get that. Just like real candy bars, big stuff. He looks at me, a little kid, he sees me, he believes me. He's like, okay, how would he act in the, in the backyard. See, how would he act? If he believed my promise, he would know that this greater reward was coming and he would be helping his friends and he would be meek towards my will, gentle in his approach to his friends during the candy hunt. See, because knowing that something better was coming that would be brought to him would cause him to act very different from the other boys. Jesus has made a promise to the meek. They will inherit the earth. His disciples who are tamed to his will and gentle towards others will have the earth brought to them. Now and in the new heavens and the new earth. It's a double promise. The best, uh, uh, let him bless you now. He knows what's good. And, oh, and by the way, the new heavens and the new earth. That's right. You're going to be one of those that goes through the judgment and you'll experience the new improved version. And who could give that promise except the judge himself? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I remember another, uh, like my dad, I remember a Sunday school teacher using a, a visual aid, and we came in one day, it was about six of us, and he had little Dixie cups of Kool-Aid on the table in front of us. And uh, that was huge, because you gotta realize at church, man, any kind of drink or food is just huge, because you're starving. You come so early and you're there all morning. And uh, so that was huge. And the teacher had subtly and deliberately put differing amounts of Kool-Aid in the cups. Some were half full or less, and one was full to the brim. Then he said, have some Kool-Aid, guys. And not realizing I was going to be the object lesson for the morning, I reached for the full cup. <laughs> and uh, it made a powerful impression on me. See, there's a lot of Kool-Aid in the earth. There's a lot, and there's different amounts. People are obviously experiencing different amounts. And I just wonder, 
who really gets the most? Those who are first to grab what seems best? Nope. And if we're reaching in our life for what we think is good, it should haunt us. Do we really, how do we know we have what's best? See, this is deep. This goes so deep. Are you blessing your own life? And you gotta wonder, Jesus could have done it better. You look out in the world and you think, I don't care how well you do, it could have been better. How do I know I'm getting the best, the most? if I'm doing it? How do you know that you're getting the most Kool-Aid? It all depends on the approach. Some are blessing their own life. Others are waiting on God's blessing. Some are making their lives happen. And others are like, no, 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 my life's a happening. (laughs) It's a happening. I'm just waiting for God and what he's gonna do and how he's gonna work. Some are serving themselves and others are letting God bring them what is best. And I'll just say, if you're taking the wrong approach, you could be missing so much and you're the only one to blame. And it all comes back to yielding to Jesus. He says, take the bit, take the bit, be tame towards yourself and toward me, be meek in your approach to the world because of your poverty of spirit and your mourning about it. And I will bring you the earth. Jesus says, I, you don't even know how much you could enjoy until you're meek to me, Jesus says. You don't even know. Because I made you to be happy, to enjoy. I know how to delight you so much more. I'll do so much of a better job. I know when Lynn and I go to an expensive restaurant on on special occasions, I don't try to order myself. I I ask the wait staff, I'm like, what do you get when you order off the menu? What is popular? Because I don't feel like, I don't go to those restaurants much, that I have a good idea of what's really good there. In fact, if it's a really good restaurant, I just, Fold up the menu and hand it back. You have raving fans. You're awesome. You, what are you most excited about cooking today? Just bring that. See, that's a much better eating experience. At least for a guy like me who doesn't understand at those restaurants what's really good. And I think that's what a meek person finally does in their life. They just fold up the menu and they say, you know what, Jesus? You bless me. You know what's good. It's a fundamental decision you make when you're following Jesus. And it makes you meek. And it's a unique characteristic of a genuine Christian. Genuine Christian. I want you to imagine two offices that are directly across the hall from one another. And the first office is called the Please Me Department. Please Me Office. And all the furniture and the equipment and the supplies in that office are all oriented to that goal, that purpose, that vision. Please me. And by nature, we're born into that office in the kingdom of this earth. That's where we all are. But we notice across the hall another office. And at some point in our life, we see there it says, please God, please Jesus. And, 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 and you look in there and you see a whole different set of furniture, equipment, supplies. And it's all dedicated to pleasing Jesus. Completely different vision. Completely different goal. And, 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 and so those of us who have encountered Jesus, this is such a fundamental thing to understand. At some point when Jesus really draws us to himself and that, that, that's for real, we have gone from that please me office across the hall to the please Jesus, the please God office. And our whole goal in life is to put a smile on his face. We've given up that old, that old office. See, the, the kingdom of heaven, the heroes are servants, not celebrities. It's just a fundamental difference. To be great in the kingdom of heaven is to serve and please God, not ourselves. Big, big deal, big and bold, banner truth. Jesus picked as one of the eight things that you'll know you're really one of his disciples. Have you made that fundamental decision? And those of us who do at some point, we're sitting in the please God and we look, we look back at some point, we're not even thinking and we look back and we go, whoa, look back in that old office. Look who's sitting in my chair and it's Jesus. He's now taken over, pleasing us. He's now in charge of blessing us. He says, you're blessed are the meek, for, for they shall inherit the earth. He says, you do that, you be meek, I'll bring the whole earth. Now and the new heavens, the new earth. You just give that over to me. Now who's gonna do a better job of blessing us, us or Jesus? This is just so fundamental, but you have to hear it. You have to sense it. It has to go in your, deep, your DNA. It's what makes you so, it's what makes us so different. We're meek. 
when we, we might play with competition, def defense, and fighting, and all these kind of things, but we know for the bigger stuff, it's got to be Jesus. So be gentle. We will inherit the earth. That's his promise. It's a gift of grace. Well, let me do one application as we close. Um, and this is Jesus' application later in the same chapter. Again, we're not doing the whole Sermon on the Mount, so I'm just going to skip ahead to these verses in the same chapter that are really his way of applying the profound truth in the Beatitudes, especially blessed are the meek. We look ahead to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. And Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Are y'all listening to this? I'm like, what? Don't resist him as evil? Excuse me? Jesus is a great teacher and he's dropping that to get your attention. What in the world does that mean? Turn the other cheek. That's, that whole expression comes from this teaching. What? Is that Christian? Here's a unique test. If you want to know who's really a disciple of Jesus this week, just slap them. <laughs> I'm serious. Just go up to them and smack them right across the face. And then watch what they do. This is Jesus. He's trying to get past the conceptual and he's trying to get into our real life. Smack! You hit back? You get mad? Or do you go, yeah, do put another one right over on this side. <laughs> what? Obviously, this doesn't apply. This truth does not apply to police or military or even our defense of our families. <laughs> Seriously, it doesn't apply to self-defense. The slap was an insult. It's a, it's a minor thing. <laughs> And this is where we live. We always go to the extremes, and, but, but where we live is, is being inconvenienced. It's when we're cheated. It's when we're wronged. It's when we've been shoved, picked on, slighted, passed over. Someone cuts in front of us on the highway. Someone takes the seat that we save. Someone goes in front of us in line, and we're like, what? Gas, I've been waiting in this line. I have rights. Come on. You know, I make my life happen, and you're in the way, so now I've got to get rid of you. I brought everything into my life. I have to protect it. That's our culture. Is that you? So Jesus gets right down to it. When you're slapped and you're like, Shh. you show whether you're poor in spirit, mourning and meek. So we deserve a whole lot more than being slapped. And we don't have to, we don't bust our lives and we don't protect it. I'll throw this out for our small groups if you want to talk about it. How does this relate to bullying for our children? Listen, our values on this will bleed right through to our children. Not to mention it's what happens to our kids has the biggest effect on us to test this. Ten times more what's happened to our children will test. But what are we giving them when it comes to this? What are we passing along to them? Do, of course you need to defend yourself. Of course you need to be confident. Of course you need to stick up for yourself and not be bullied. But is that going to take you to the best things in the earth? No. If you teach our kids to be meek, will that put a kick me sign on their back? Or, or, or are we thinking more it'll put a bless me sign on their back for God? Teach your children to be meek. And let Jesus, because they, the best things in our life come to us. And then so much more true for our children. We aren't even there to be defending and do all these things. So it's so much more true. Oh, Lord, how can I bless myself, but especially my kids? They've got to, and I've got to be meek when it comes to that. You're going to have to bring it to them so they even believe when they're away from me and even live a life that would be blessed. That's all got to come from you. So I'll be meek to you, and I'll wait on you to bring the earth to them. And that's so true for our kids. A number of years ago, we had a handy neighbor across the street strongly suggest um, that we use him to put in a pergo floor for our kitchen and our foyer and our bathroom. He kept suggesting it, and so finally we hired him, not realizing he wasn't insured, and he had a history of messing up projects like this. And we thought he did okay uh, until about two years later, my father-in-law was visiting, and he noticed um, that there was mildew where the den carpet met the kitchen flooring. 
And he said, I think you've got a problem here. Sure enough, as we began pulling up the floor, there was thick black mold everywhere. And we called our insurance company. They came and documented that it was faulty labor. He hadn't sealed the toilet properly in the bathroom, so every time we flushed the toilet, water was seeping between the new floor and the old laminate. To have it torn up and cleaned and replaced cost us over $3,000. And our house was out of commission for Thanksgiving and for Christmas that year. Blessed are the meek. What do you do? To be good stewards, we felt obligated to let our neighbor know and ask for him to split the cost of the repair. He strongly refused, which was no surprise on our part. He, he did offer to help put in a new floor, which my wife didn't want him to do. I don't understand why, but she didn't want him to help put in the new floor. It's hard to apply meekness in every situation, but for us, if it was $30,000, we would have taken the evidence we had to court and held him accountable to pay it just for stewardship of what God has entrusted to us. But it wasn't that much. And yet it was very frustrating, very significant. It was an example of a slap, not a stab or a shot, but a slap. And so we knew God would have us turn the other cheek. Now, as we did this, he was right across the street every day. I didn't want, how did I keep him from getting too big? As he just got bigger and bigger in our mind. You know, we're going all for all this because of you. Incompetence. It's not just. You were put, you know, and you get all into it. It helped keep him in perspective. I remember God gave me the strong impression in my mind. He's not the one who makes you rich or poor. I am. He hasn't brought you all the blessings you have. And he can't take them away. In light of all I've given you, what is $3,000 in six weeks of a messed up house? And then I realized this was our first house we owned in Virginia Beach before we moved into the one now that, that we're selling. And this is the first one. We moved in in 1998, and by the time we were selling it, it had doubled in value just because of the market. We actually sold it for more than double the price that we paid for it. And God just reminded me, and did you have anything to do with that? That timing? It's like, oh yeah, God, that's just a little reminder in the exact same area of this material blessing that just reminds me of all the other good things that you're the source of. And this man is not the one who gives or takes that away from me. He is nothing. He's no big deal. Turn the other cheek. It really helps. I wanted to give one, one practical, practical example of what I think Jesus means by that. But it's so much more important than meekness. This is about Christianity. This is about Jesus. This is about whether or not he's in your DNA and you're becoming a paper clip instead of a matchstick. This is about a kingdom change. This is about Jesus saying, follow me. And as he does, you start to show that. You don't know at the beginning, but you start to show these marks that you're really being transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Let Jesus do this. I would appeal to you, come with me up the mountain and sit and listen to Jesus talk about his first recorded sermon and what Christian is all about and let him produce this in you. Let him do it. Right now, I believe, because it's happening in my heart, that Jesus' spirit is saying to many of us, take the bit, bring your strength under control and yield to my will, and I will bless you more than you will bless yourself. And, and, and I'm telling you, only Jesus can do this. Just as a miracle. But if he's speaking to you, let that happen because that starts more than just whatever the issue is today. That starts a whole life of inheriting the earth and the afterlife. Yield, yield, yield. Be meek to Jesus. You won't be weak in your life. You won't be mild, low volume living. You won't be a doormat. You'll be powerful. You'll be one of the sons and daughters of the king. But first, you must yield. He is ready to bring the earth to you. But you must take the bit. Let him be Lord. Be comfortable letting him lead. And whatever issue he's putting his finger on, he's just going to say, I've got so much more for you than that. Yield that issue. Be meek. And then we can turn over the menu. We can turn over the whole hope for God's blessing to him and not ourselves. He'll do so much better of a job. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Thank you for that short, profound sentence. 
And I pray in this moment that you would call people, that you would do what you've done hundreds and thousands and even millions of times around the world for thousands of years, and that you would call us from one kingdom into the next and break our spirit. Give us the bit, Lord, that we would yield all that is satisfying, all that is good in the earth to you and let you just run that area of our life. Oh God, we're ready to bless you as you bless us. We take our place to please you while you take over pleasing us. Oh, Lord, especially in our culture, we're sorry for not giving you that place. You, would you put the joy in our heart, the smile on our face, even in our church, in our families? We yield to you, Lord. Truly make us poor in spirit, mourning, and then meek, and then maybe be blessed like you say. But Lord, I'm aware that this is when you really call us and do that today. Pray your blessing on the rest of our service. I thank you so much for losing in order to win when you died for us on the cross. Thank you for the meekness you showed. Bless us as we respond in Jesus' name. Amen.